so welcome everyone. Um, I'm Albert Wu. I think um, many of you know me. Um, but welcome to our third annual Sam Shapiro Lecture. Uh, and just a word about Sam before we introduce our uh, honored guest. So Sam Shapiro was a researcher in, maybe in public health policy, maybe in health services research. In any event, he spent his career studying the effectiveness of healthcare interventions. Interestingly, he earned a Bachelor of Science and Math from Brooklyn College. Um, he, he, uh, but he never earned a degree beyond that uh, Bachelor of Science. Um, he, in the 1960s, though, he became director of research for the health insurance plan, HIP, of, of Greater New York. And he became interested in mammography and whether it was worth doing, um, it was, whether it was worth screening women, and um, developed some of the first and probably the most influential evidence that, in fact, it could save lives. So he was uh, recruited to Hopkins and came here in 1973. He uh, came to direct the Center for Health Services and Outcomes Research, uh, which was then the Health Services Research and Development Center. And uh, pretty soon his reputation spread and uh, the, the, the group and the department got m many students and was regarded as really one of the most popular professors uh, on the East Baltimore campus. Uh, he was Professor Shapiro, but he was not Dr. Shapiro because uh, no advanced degrees. He never earned that doctorate, but in 1998, Johns Hopkins did award him an honorary doctorate. So I think it's uh, very fitting uh, that we uh, have today as our esteemed guest um, a an, an perhaps equally important and impactful figure, Lisa Simpson. Um, and uh, Lisa, as, as I think you all know, is president and CEO of Academy Health, which uh, she's done since 2011. She's a pediatrician, which we've heard several times today, um, <laughs> and a uh, nationally regarded researcher. And she has really been a passionate advocate for generating evidence and using it to make health and healthcare better. Uh, she has published uh, many important articles, but I think that perhaps her greatest triumph has been in advocating for and promoting uh, the, the, the entire field, drawing people into it, promoting both individuals and organizations. She, uh, she has an interesting training history, and uh, uh, I, I would like to emulate, I, if, I, if I had been smarter, I would have done exactly what she did. She uh, earned undergraduate and medical degrees at Trinity College Dublin, uh, which is a beautiful place. Some of you may have seen it. Um, she earned her MPH at the University of Hawaii. <laughs> and I clearly missed on that one. Um, she did a postdoc at UCSF um, and uh, got an honorary Doctor of Science degree from Georgetown um, in nursing, actually, uh, just a few years ago. Before joining Academy Health, she was a professor of pediatrics. Uh, she had an endowed chair at the University of South Florida. Um, uh, she w worked uh, in policy research at the University of Cincinnati Children's and, and many other, she's held really many, many other um, very important and responsible titles. Um, perhaps uh, she was elected to the Institute of Medicine, the National Academy of Medicine in 2013. Um, and importantly, she is an avid Twitterer. She is at Dr. Simpson HSR. Um, because even though she is really famous to us, she is probably the second most famous Lisa Simpson <laughs> um, to the uh, wider public media, and Lisa Simpson was already taken. Um, so without further ado, uh, Lisa, thank you very much. Thank you, Al. And what I was saying to the students when I had a chance to meet with them earlier is um, my other claim to fame is that I have a sister named Maggie, for those of you who watch the show. My father's name was Homer. No, I'm kidding. It was Howard. So um, thank you, Albert, and, and thank you to the whole Hopkins family for inviting me here. I remember when, Don, you were still uh, the official head of your de department, right? 
um, you gave me an adjunct appointment. So a few years, I was actually an adjunct. I was actually an adjunct professor. That's one of the things I tend to tell students throughout their career. I like to keep my options open. And so one thing I did, um, it, Albert made it sound like I changed jobs every year, that I did so many different things. Not quite, but one thing I kept constant was that whatever job I did have, I always kept an adjunct appointment at a university um, because my life is really at the intersection of research and action. Um, and uh, so, and I remember when I was negotiating my uh, package to become CEO with John Colmers, another Hopkins uh, figure, uh, leader. Um, I said, but I want an adjunct appointment at a university. And they said, well, why? Um, you know, I said, uh, I'm a researcher. <laughs> So it wasn't John who asked that question. I'll leave it at that. But anyway, so my adjunct appointment is at GW now. So, all right. So today, um, the, 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 the challenge with any lecture that's as grandiose and sort of full of hubris as the term the future of health services research, um, you're going to get sort of the world according to Lisa, for those of you who read the world according to GARP. So it's just a very slight um, slice or view into it. Um, it is not based, all the disclaimers, it is not based on any systematic review of the field. Um, and, uh, oh, I forgot to put in a CME slide in case folks are claiming CME. Um, I have no conflicts to declare, as one always says, I wish I did. <laughs> so um, I'm going to talk about setting the stage first, um, because I have to tell you, uh, Albert mentioned uh, Academy Health. I have to tell you a little bit about us and why we care so passionately about health services research. And then I'm focusing on our three Ds. And how many child health people are there in the room? What? I know what it feels like being the token child health person in a room. I've been there my whole life, practically. Um, the reason I was going to ask that is um, the three Ds here are actually in pediatrics or child health. We talk about the four Ds of, of child health and why it's different. These are three different Ds. But anyway, I want to focus my remarks on three areas that we're spending a lot of time at Academy Health trying to think about and figure out how our field and our association um, helps our members uh, confront these. And I would be remiss before I went any further before doing a shout out to my past chair of the board of directors. Daryl Gaskin, Dr. Gaskin, welcome. So um, Academy Health is the Professional Society for Health Services Research and Health Policy. And you'll see here our vision and mission. I will not read them out, um, only to emphasize the words that it's all about evidence, evidence in decision making, evidence in policy and practice. So again, I've spent my life at that intersection while I've published a bit, not nearly as much as Albert Wu, um, you know, uh, one quarter the number of publications according to your bio. So I'm, I'm, I think I'm just reaching the 100 mark. Um, you know, research for research's sake, uh, not so important to me. I really want to see it used. And that's why it feels really good being at Academy Health and trying to help all of our members do that more effectively. Um, and right now in, in the country, um, you may have come, if some of you came to our policy conference or you've been reading anything like Science Magazine or any of the public uh, press, um, a real concern about truth, uh, misinformation, the value of data, the value of evidence. Um, and so now more than ever, I really focus on the North Star, that evidence does matter. It does uh, make us better and make better choices. And so I think Academy Health has redoubled its efforts in, in as a the voice for health services research and talking about how evidence matters. And those are our three strategic goals. So we work with our members, we help to harvest evidence, synthesize and translate findings, and accelerate adoption and use. In case you wondered how big we are, there we are. And the point of this slide is not for you to read it, but to see the diversity of colors, like lots of different types of organizational members, including Hopkins. Um, but we're not just about academic health services research. In fact, we are, based on our data, more than 50% of our members are actually working outside of academic settings. Their primary paycheck. They may have an adjunct appointment like me, but their primary paycheck is from another setting. They may still be doing research. Um, many of them are, but they're in all kinds of settings. And we have a number of interest groups um, that are very active. So what is health services research? So here is the official definition. And so on a day of very good lung capacity, I can actually say that in one breath, which is not today, 
Um, and so what I often do, particularly when I'm talking to non-research audiences, um, I talk about the questions that, academy, that health services research answers, because that is much more sort of tangible for folks. What works in healthcare, and how does that answer vary by patient or community, the for whom? Under what circumstances? All about the context, particularly in implementation science, implementation research, it's all about the context. And then the dominant conversation in America always, but especially sort of growing even more um, is at what cost as more and more individual consumers, patients, and families are exposed to more of the cost sharing of their coverage and their healthcare utilization, much growing uh, re recurrent attention to the cost of healthcare. And then I think a big question is the issue of spread and scale. Once we know what works, how do we not only sustain it at the site where the intervention uh, or approach was developed, but how do we spread that across different settings with the right balance of adaptation and fidelity? So you have the effect size you had in the original study, but it's adapted to different settings and different communities appropriately. So those are the questions we answer. And as I think about health services research and some of the things we're confronting as a field before I dive into our three Ds for today, um, one thing that has always existed as long as I've been in the field and if, you know probably since its inception um, is the demand for our research to be more timely, more relevant, driven by the needs of decision makers, whether that decision maker is you know the sort of emblematic national policymaker who's going to change something in Medicare, like Seema Verma, or a state policymaker like your director of health and human uh, mental hygiene, right? It's the Department of Health and Mental Hygiene in Baltimore. Um, or increasingly, you know, pa Patty Brown over in your health system, the leader of health plans, delivery systems, et cetera. They want more timely, more relevant research and balancing that with the appropriate rigor. And too often the debate, um, I find, I think it's getting better, but again, I'm probably biased, um, is, you know, RCT or nothing. Like if it's not an RCT, and by RCT people think randomized clinical trial with highly selected populations that are non-representative, that has high internal validity, no generalizability, and all those characteristics versus just straight observational data that you tweak with all your you know, instrumental variables and et cetera, et cetera. Well, the reality is there is a continuum of methods between those where you could really get to, you know, maybe some random assignment, natural experiment, you know, step wedge designs, et cetera, where you're still being timely relevant, but maximizing your rigor. So I think some that's certainly a, uh, an area we're focused on. I've already mentioned the engagement of the end user audience. And I just came out of uh, last week, uh, Academy Health uh, held uh, the ninth annual Health Data Palooza. Um, and most of the audience is too young to know what Lollapalooza is, so whoever named this was of a certain age, not me. Um, but uh, talk about focus on innovation, value, and population health. Those were sort of the watchwords, but how does one tackle those with a focus on data, technology, and transformation? Of course, data, I'm going to speak more about it, but um, one, two, three, four, five. Yes, I've got five Vs there, and Jonathan, there's probably two more I've forgotten, but it's all about volume, variety, velocity, veracity, and value of the data, and then who we are. Our, how do we use our new methods? Who is the workforce? And then the continued pressure on federal funding. And there you see my Twitter handle, in case you forgot what Dr. Wu said. And feel free to tweet. It's all public domain. Um, so that sets the stage. So Academy Health, HSR, trends affecting our field that we're all trying to respond to. And I'm focusing on three of those trends and three of those areas. So, um, you know, I'm not talking about patient reported outcomes. I'm not talking about CER. Uh, Dr. Siegel and I worked on CER issues back in the day. Um, I'm just focusing on these three. Um, so uh, the way I think about these three is that, let me go back. So there's a lot of attention to social determinants right now. Why, I'll get into that, but really, we as a field, I mean, I remember when Dave Kindig spoke at the Academy Health meeting 25 years ago. It's not a new thing for health services research, researchers to focus on population health and social determinants. But it's come into sort of its own that I, we are, as a field, much more focused on it. And there are a number of reasons for that. But largely, we've focused on the way mm -hmm. social determinants affects healthcare delivery, sometimes health, but it's really that's the direction of the arrow. Increasingly, uh, we're seeing more and more attention to how can healthcare delivery address social determinants, so uh, a two-way interaction there. 
And then the reality is, how can we leverage data and what kinds of data to help us have that bi-directional, uh, effective interaction between healthcare delivery, sort of as traditionally thought about evolving to more effectively address social determinants? So first, I'm going to talk about social determinants. So uh, again, two definitions for you here. This is the classic CDC definition, again, as the SDH are the complex, integrated, and overlapping social structures and economic systems that are responsible for most, most health inequities, and it goes on. Um, what you may have seen more recently that is, um, because when you talk to some audiences, social determinants, the cognitive shortcut, you know, D Daniel Kahneman's Thinking Fast and Slow, you're going to get them in a cognitive frame of socialism. So social determinants, right away, um, one thing I've learned in my 20 years in Washington and two stints is that words matter and which words you use telegraph to your audience which side of the political spectrum you're on. So be very careful which words you use even if they're evidence-based, how you frame it, and there's a whole lot of research on framing, um, uh, you know, affects how it's received. And so um, RWJ actually invested in a very significant sort of branding exercise and came up with this, which is what more and more of us are seeing used as social determinants are the conditions in the places where people live, learn, work, play, and pray. That's been added more recently that affect a wide range of health risks and outcomes. Now, so we're, we're talking about it more, but are we making progress? And so um, I could you know, spend the whole talk just giving you evidence of how little progress we're making on addressing social determinants of health, unfortunately. But I think this, I like this quote particularly because um, I think it captures it all, that two years after the largest expansion of health insurance in 50 years, inequality remains a fundamental attribute of American health care. So a long way to go, and health systems because of some of the changing financial uh, arrangements, are finally starting to look more upstream, as uh, we say. So another way to think about social determinants is how they are part of the fabric of this, you know, this is not a, a Western blot, okay, for the clinicians. This, if you haven't seen this map before, how many of you have seen this image before? Okay, so this is, um, out of two weeks ago, Chris Murray and his team, the Global Burden of Disease Group, published the latest update on global burden of disease in America and by state. And so again, what you see is color variation, right? So this is states on, uh, on the column and rows uh, at the top, because it's illegible. This was the best I could do to figure out how to take this JAMA uh, thing. You'll see all the various aspects of it. And each sta state um, is in terms of which um, conditions are highest um, ranked in that state. And then, of course, I had to put there, you see Maryland. So number one, the worst one is uh, the second thing, uh, high body mass index. So um, buried underneath all of this are, as you know, the diseases of despair, the you know increasing or leveling off of uh, the gains in mortality, all the patterns of how social determinants express themselves in the health of populations and variation across communities. So what are some of the determinants that healthcare um, and policymakers in the health space are focusing on the most? Well, these are four that certainly, uh, the first two have really risen to the top of a lot of attention that folks are trying to, to deal with. Uh, personally, I'll talk about ACEs because that's an area that we're working on that I think is critical. Um, and I mentioned here bias and racism. Not that I'm gonna go into it later. It's a whole, again, talk of its own. But we're having conversations in health services research about implicit, explicit bias, racism, every other ism, in a way we have not had previously in my career. And really the role, uh, since unequal treatment came out from the IOM in, what year was that, like early 2000s, um, the conversation has shifted um, to much more sort of uh, explicit conversations about uh, confronting this in healthcare systems. So housing, what do we know about housing? So I have to showcase this because I was one of the judges for the Hearst Health Prize. And I don't know if anybody in Baltimore wants to apply next year. We're d they're doing it again next year. This is a no strings attached $100,000 award. So 
it's worth applying. Um, but it's a tough uh, thing to be judged on because you really have to show um, outcomes. And so here, this uh, Massachusetts initiative showed, as you can see here, a 78% reduction in emergency utilization. And importantly, because we want to look at not just process, but also outcomes, um, look at satisfaction with their health increasing from 29% to 63% after uh, supportive and permanent housing was established. The other point about housing is that it's not just the one study or the one site, and this is a broader reflection on our field because so much is changing right now. And just pick up any health affairs, and I'm going to quote a couple of their studies. Um, they're always the this program, the showcase, this case study, and they're really helpful. Uh, but they're just that thousand points of light. How are we generating a body of knowledge like this rapid evidence review around a range of interventions for the same challenge? And what are we learning about um, a bot from a body of knowledge? Because that's really what we have to do in health services research is bring together that body of knowledge to inform policy making. The other thing, um, we were talking earlier um, with the students about translating research into policy. We're trying to do that more and more and more effectively because we still have lots of challenges. And I think one of the things we're learning is how to use uh, infographics more effectively to tell the story uh, because as fast as the world was moving 20 years ago, we have to move even faster. Attention spans for your intended user audience are even shorter. Um, and so again, that's, that's one that we did for this report. Food insecurity, uh, we were talking uh, with the faculty just before this about the different ways of screening for social determinants of health in the clinical setting. Um, there is the hunger vital sign, which some of you might be familiar with. That's being adapted in different ways to try to use it clinically. AAP developed a two-item version. But again, the evidence is this is another area where we don't know enough yet about what's the best way to do this in a clinical setting. Um, because it may not, while the total hunger vital sign has high reliability, specificity, and sensitivity, these adaptations are not so robust, and so figuring that out. And then the evidence base for how the health system can engage in identifying and then addressing food insecurity. Uh, again, the evidence base is only emerging. Um, and there's one example actually here from Chase Brexton Health in Baltimore. I have no idea where that is, but I put it in because I saw Baltimore. So um, they are doing uh, on-site SNAP application screening and treatment. And then there's a more recent study. This is one of the ones in health affairs, which I, I liked because, number one, it was a random assigned, you know, there was an intervention and control group. It wasn't, um, so you have a, uh, an intervention control match, which is great. And they found some evidence for uh, reductions in monthly medical spending per person for both medically tailored and non-tailored foods. And again, the, the, it was more significant. The, the upper one is the point less than 0 0.001, and that one's 0 0.05. Um, so we're starting, again, emerging evidence that this can make a difference on the, the end point that the healthcare system cares about, which is costs. Um, and um, so my last example of a social determinant area that I wanted to touch on was ACEs. Um, I have the great good fortune of working with one of the Hopkins faculty members, Christina Bethel, who's in the School of Public Health. Um, and we've been partnered for the last four years on ACEs-related work. This is data from the National Survey of Children's Health. Um, all, all to say, I hope you'll know what ACEs are, adverse childhood experiences. Um, but the point is, huge variation. Um, with two or more ACEs varying from 15 to almost 31%. And the impact of adverse childhood experiences are um, uh, and their prevalence um, and and correlation with other factors is significant. You'll see that um, for patients for children with just one ACEs, and this is a parent reported on the National Survey of Children's Health. Um, the prevalence of children with chronic conditions and special needs is higher. Um, the, a fewer number of those children live in supportive neighborhoods, and far fewer have mothers who have uh, very good or excellent health. So it's very much a family systems issue, and healthcare systems around the country are trying to figure out how to identify and then address adverse childhood experiences um, in families. And we published a labor of love over four years, pulling together all these papers and commissioned authors. Uh, it came out last, Feb uh, last September, um, and this is open access, so if you're interested, you can get access to all of these articles in here. Um, and we developed a national agenda for research and policy um, to focus not just on the translation of science of ACEs and resilience and nurturing relationship into both practice and policy, but also to cultivate the conditions for cross-sector collaboration, um, to try to do these what Christy calls launch and learn uh, programs, which is really you're launching it 
right? You're trying it and you're trying to learn at the same time because we don't have the answer. There's no one model yet that works in these sort of panoply of trauma-informed care that's developing around the country. There are trauma-informed cities, trauma-informed health departments, lots of trauma-informed work, but we're still in the innovation phase, so we have to learn from that innovation. Um, and at the, the fourth uh, priority there is rewarding and restoring uh, safe nurturing relationships and um, community-led prevention and healing. I'm going to skip that one. And then the final area of social determinants that I think is another very productive area for health services research to engage in is the focus on state innovation. So Maryland is unique, right? It has its own you know, history of state policy. and now global budgets and going to all kinds of, you know, really trying to push the more focus on total cost of care and population health. But many other agents, state agencies are also innovating. Um, and we are a country that that if you look at the history of federal policy transformation, we do like to learn from a state model. So whether it's it was Badger Care in Wisconsin in the 80s and 90s that led to welfare reform, to TANF in the early in the mid 90s, whether it's the Romney Care in Massachusetts that led to Obamacare. Um, again, we like to test things out in this big country at the state level. So I think it's very important to focus on this. And here are just some initiatives. And because of this focus on states, uh, Academy Health does uh, convene the Medicaid Medical Directors Network. So this is a network every state almost every state, has a medical director. So that's the senior physician, not the political appointee. And the average lifespan of a political appointee is 14 months, I've, I've been told. So you can imagine trying to run a Medicaid program when you're only in the job for 14 months and then you're out of there. So the medical director ends up having a lot more longevity. We've got some we've been working with for 15 years. And um, they sort of live at the intersection of the managed care contracting decisions, the incentives, the quality measurement all of these things that are really going to drive actual service delivery. And a number of states are trying to figure out how to, um, to address social determinants. And in fact, here is a report that came out from the National Quality Forum just last year, last December, um, which looked very directly at how could Medicaid programs under current authority, Medicaid is already, even without a waiver, Medicaid is an incredibly flexible program compared to some. Um, and some states are using those Medicaid authorities and adding to them from waivers, like Massachusetts just got a massive waiver to, um, to address population health and social determinants, to do a number of different uh, activities, and here are some of the ones that uh, the National Quality Forum uh, underscored. Now, one of the things I'll come back to when I talk about delivery is this third last one, create standards for inputting and extracting social needs data from EHRs. Um, there is progress here, we were just talking about it, but it's, you know, like all things in America, huge variation, and, um, you know, we're going to have a lot of noise before we actually have information from this new set of data. So, so the question then is, so all this attention to social determinants of health, um, what do we know about what is working when uh, we try to address them? And so this is a recent review, um, and actually Betsy Bradley was the senior author on this, um, and she's of course the classic work, American Paradox, and how Europeans, if you add up how much we spend in healthcare and social services and compare it to European countries, the totals are actually pretty similar. It's just we spend it all in health care, and they spend much more of their spend in social services. So it's that, you know, and yet they get better outcomes. So um, obviously calling into question, how are we spending uh, the total public purse on, on, on well-being? So the so to, to tee up their, their report, they, can, they, they say that the literature has not been reviewed comprehensively to generate an integrated evidence-based summary of how to best address the social determinants to achieve positive health effects without increasing or perhaps even decreasing healthcare spending. So again, through the lens, lens of the outcome being healthcare spending, there are a lot of studies in the education sector and the other sectors that look at the impact of those programs. But from the lens of healthcare spending, what do these programs do? And so they went and reviewed a decade of studies um, and, you know, I'm so used to reading evidence-based practice center reports, and they say, you know, for this question we found, you know, 5,000 studies or 25,000, and we ended up with 32. Mm -hmm. 
you know, that qualified for inclusion in the report. So the denominator here is surprisingly small, but these were their inclusion criteria. Um, and, and I think probably the narrowness came from quantitative measures of health outcomes, costs, or both. They really wanted not a, a process measure, but something that was outcome or cost driven. Um, and a study design that was documented enough that you could judge the quality of the study. Um, and they found 123 articles. Of those, only 39 met the inclusion criteria. And here is um, the result. So you see on the far left, out of a total of 12 studies on housing support, 42% uh, documented positive health outcomes, 11 studies on nutrition support, seven had that same uh, outcomes impact, income support, three out of four, um, and, and so forth. So definitely a pretty positive, at least for the evidence that is rigorous enough to meet the inclusion criteria, we're starting you know, to see that healthcare impact. Um, but they conclude that few studies are currently examining the impact of social interventions on healthcare spending, and few study uh, um, looked at the other sectors. You saw it was housing, food insecurity, the ones I'd mentioned previously, but transportation, public safety, education, income support, uh, far fewer studies are looking at those aspects of social determinants. Um, and they just focus on low-income families, not surprisingly, but some of these social determinants um, are more uh, widespread. And of course, they make the point about the methodology. As I read some of the studies that are included, there are far too many pre-post to my liking um, with pretty, you know, sort of light quality, but they didn't adjust for that in their conclusions. So that's social determinants. Lots of work to be done. If you're building your career in health services research, lots of questions to be answered. So now let's look at what about healthcare delivery? Um, and, you know, there's so much going on here and so many questions because we still have this, right? If you haven't seen this graphic from the IOM, Better Care at Lower Costs, this is still the reality. Our science leads to evidence and care and patient experience, but all along the way, tons of missed opportunities. You know, the, sort of the drop off, what John Eisenberg in the uh, 90s wrote about the voltage drops, that we just don't um, deliver the care we should for the amount of inputs that we're, we have. Um, so this is still the health system, but where the, uh, you know, a lot of the attention is right now is obviously in payment and delivery innovation. At the Academy Health Annual Research Meeting coming up this June, if you haven't booked your ticket, it's expensive to get to Seattle these days, you should. Um, and we're expecting lots of people there. Um, these, we have a payment and delivery um, transformation theme. It always gets a lot of great abstracts. Um, but this is just one sort of you know, lens into what's going on that my fam and her colleagues summarized last year. Obviously, the $10 billion that the Affordable Care Act uh, gave the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation has a big part to play in this. It's really spurred this, but there's also the whole private market with, again, the inexorable rise of healthcare costs. The private sector employers and payers are like, enough already. We just, that, that's not a controllable line uh, spending item. We, we need to control it. So lots going on. As you can see here, she concluded that um, clinicians participating in payment reform represent every sta state, many medical specialties, and diverse healthcare facilities. So it's pretty widespread. So given that backdrop, here is, I, I like this set of questions. Just I, again, I want to encourage you, there are so many questions to be asked in health services research um, out there. So this is from a report that we did with support from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation and the uh, Network for Regional Healthcare Improvement. Um, so first of all, and there was one of the students I met earlier today is interested in organizational behavior and management. I, oh, there you are. Um, so, you know, these issues around the trusted convener, a lot, of, there's an adage right now that I hear a lot, which is change, which is all about what's happening in healthcare right now. Change happens at the speed of trust. And so how do you get different organizations together to actually work across sectors, across silos, to change how care is delivered, to change health in a community. And so here are a whole number of questions around structural and organizational factors that these groups um, identified. Then integration of care. You know, we've heard a lot about care coordination, community health workers, health leads, you know, all these different approaches, um, building off of PCMH, patient-centered medical home, and other models. Um, but still many questions uh, to be answered about how to do that effectively and at what cost. You know, what's the squeeze? How much do you spend? How much do you pay per member per month to get what kinds of health outcomes and cost savings or, you know, cost neutral? Um, and then there are all the issues around metrics, data, and evidence that support 
the delivery system's ability to move towards higher value um, and better population health. And then finally, um, where folks are focusing is the, the funds flow. What about the dollars? How does one change those and realign those uh, for improvement? And I'm just, that's actually very small words. Um, I'm having trouble reading them, but um, you'll have my slides. But again, these are just a sampler set of questions, but these were generated by communities around the country. These are folks who are trying to change care in their community, and this is what they're struggling with in terms of the questions they're asking. And um, coming out of this same RWJ initiative, which is around payment reform for population health, uh, we worked with Discern Health. This is from a commission paper they did um, of sort of the preconditions um, that you need to have in place to really get um, a, a community, uh, a set of health systems moving towards population health. There's the shared data infrastructure. I already mentioned the trusted environment. There's certainly the payment and financing model, but then you also need to align uh, clinical and uh, community resources. So it's not, you need all four of these for progress to happen. And so when you talk about alignment, one of the big areas is aligning risk. Who's at risk if this doesn't work? You know, is it just an upside risk? You all get rewarded if things work and there's no downside risk, or do you lose money when you don't meet your targets and benchmarks? Um, and so here, um, they, they just outlined the differences between hierarchical and a parallel risk. So, you know, the HMO or the, 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 the health plan works with an ACO who passes on some portion of that risk to the, the practice site. Um, maybe uh, more if one were really innovative, what if the one to the right is a community-based organization who's going to be working? Um, you know, are they at financial risk for meeting targets or not? Or are they just both aligned towards the same goal? So understanding all this complexity of who's bearing risk and to what extent does that um, support versus impede uh, movement on population health. So they concluded they from their um, review of a lot of these models, um, they identified, you know, some of the strategies that are needed. Um, and I think, not surprisingly, most community-based organizations who are either doing housing or food insecurity or transportation, any of those social determinants, um, they have no, no experience with risk bearing. This is not their world. They're used to either philanthropic dollars or their, you know, community uh, block grant for social services. It's a whole new world, so it makes it, you know, the, the learning curve is pretty steep. Um, having the data infrastructure and the data sharing agreements is absolutely critical. Now, Maryland, again, you have Chris, but you don't have social service data. You said, finally, after 35 years, you're going to maybe have some social service data? Okay. Little tiny bit. Okay. So you're ahead of the game, right? Um, you have at least an infrastructure to build on. Um, and the importance of starting small and using pilots. When I see that, I always say, okay, but how are you evaluating the pilot? Give us some decent data because I don't want this spread unless I have some degree of confidence that there is going to be a replicable effect of some size. Um, so then the question is, well, how do you actually measure social determinants? And again, um, there's a lot of progress here, and a lot of progress means a lot of different tools have emerged. So now we're in the confusion stage of we had no tools to identify social determinants, and now we have lots of different ones. And we, someone mentioned it already in our session, uh, SIREN is an initiative at UCSF that's really trying to bring folks together around measuring these social determinants in reliable ways. But here is just a, a set of, of the ones that I, and again, EPIC, SIREN, you know, Cerner, lots of different tools available. Um, and underneath that tool is, you know, are the data elements specified consistently? You know, who's collecting it, where and how? All will affect the quality of that data. I'm going to skip that. And um, one of the things we're learning about moving, uh, about addressing uh, population health is some things uh, really help, like having a sole or dominant market player. Like when I worked at Cincinnati Children's, sole dominant player, much easier to sort of get everybody around the table to have a conversation about social determinants when you have that kind of a, uh, anchor institution. So there's a lot of discussion about anchor institutions. Again, an organizational question about what kinds, you know, what are the characteristics of successful anchor institutions, et cetera. Um, and then obviously, if, if the delivery organization hasn't even done basic care improvement, getting them to worry about doing improvement for social determinants is going to be a longer stretch. You kind of have to have a culture of improvement and change um, and adaptation to even get there. 
Now, this is uh, another one of those case examples. So this was, again, just published in the April Health Affairs uh, by Wesson and colleagues, where Baylor Scott and White in Dallas partnered with the Department of Public um, of Parks and Recreation. Um, and, you know, again, they only did a retrospective pre-post design, so I wish they had something stronger. Um, but again, they're showing some, you know, impact in terms of, again, process measures here, but ED and inpatient encounters. So you can, uh, I didn't catch the assessment of cost impact, but. So I've made the point already about rigorous methods. I encourage you to look at this publication on our website. We've been doing a stream of work at Academy Health with partners in the UK and here um, uh, around the various methods for evaluating complex interventions. And if you're attending the annual research meeting, we have a workshop on this on the Saturday beforehand from one till five. It's a, you have to register for it separately. And there are a whole new set of PCORI standards that are going to be finalized, I think, next week that we commented on. That's one of the roles Academy Health has, is to comment on these new standards that come out, and then we get comments from our Methods Council and help to inform uh, sort of national policy around some of these issues we care deeply about. So the third area I want to touch on quickly before I wrap up and we get to some questions is obviously what we need to be able to address care delivery improvement and social determinants together, and that's our data infrastructure. So Academy Health has a number of data initiatives, as uh, Daryl Gaskin, Dr. Gaskin knows. We've been working a lot on networks of learning around how to use new data, um, the new types of data, and open data. And across all of those, we're trying to figure out what is health data science, okay? That subset of data science that is using, that is working in the health space, answering questions like the ones I just uh, uh, gave examples of, but many, many more. And so one initiative we're working on in partnership with Stewards of Change, and one of the sites is Maryland, is really looking at interoperability, um, but from the welfare system, the human services side, into healthcare. So rather than going from the healthcare side out to social services, it's trying to address it from that vantage point. So, and there, again, like many communities and networks, it's about convening, trying to learn from folks who are on the ground, uh, working on these issues, and we've been working with SIREN as well. Has anybody ever heard of All In, Data for Community Health? Okay, so this was an initiative that um, four years ago, uh, the Office of the National Coordinator for Health IT, Federal, put a couple million dollars in, and Robert Wood Johnson Foundation put a couple million dollars into two different initiatives. We were leading the ONC one. Uh, folks at uh, Peter, um, I'm blanking on Peter's name. Anyway, Peter Eckhart um, at Illinois Public Health Institute was working on DASH. And the two of uh, Allison and Peter got together and said, it's silly for us to be working on similar things, which is how do you align data across sectors for population community health? And so they joined in and then realized there were a bunch of other funded you know, philanthropic initiatives that are also tr grappling with this data for community health. And so they created this network of networks and it's called All In for Community Health. And we're still participating on that. And you'll see it's got these core components. So if you're interested, I uh, there's the um, website. I would really encourage you, but it's some very exciting work going on across the country in multiple sites um, about um, how to work across sectors to address population health. So then, the key question of how do we integrate social determinants of health into our EHRs, because that's, if we're going to, you know, try to act on it, the first thing we need to know is who to act on what for. Um, so there are a whole ton of technical issues. We were talking about so, some of those earlier, um, and, and this was, again, from uh, the recent health affairs. But, you know, what are the standards? I already alluded to that. And then the limitations of our coding. You've heard the old adage, garbage in, garbage out. So they... Um, Cantor and Thorpe conclude that there's no single current biomedical standard that captures the breadth of information necessary for documenting the determinants in a manner appropriate for clinical care, quality improvement, and research. So lots of work to be done. If this is your, your zen, as somebody said recently, you know, this is a good area. You can make a career out of this, right, Jonathan? <laughs> and then there's the implementation issues. Even when you figured out all the technical issues, are you doing, and we we're talking about this, you know, are you collecting the data from the individual patient in front of you, or are you linking that patient record to community data about housing, zip code level data, other sources of data that you're linking into the patient record? How are you integrating it into your clinical decision support? How do you actually make it actionable during the clinical encounter? And then the workflow issues. Who's gonna ask these sometimes sensitive questions? 
And uh, where? Where's that privacy? Not sitting out in your, you know, waiting room. And once you ask the questions, what if you, you know, as some clinicians will say, you open Pandora's box. You've got to be able to do something or else you're left, you know, the patient may be re-traumatized by the question or you're left feeling very, um, you know, you know, what's the word for me? You know, like inadequate in trying to face these very deep and real needs that these families have. And then there are the policy issues. You know, you need a whole different infrastructure, not just for in the clinic, but then referrals, tracking, up-to-date resource lists. Um, any of you heard of the MAPS Core? Okay, so uh, another colleague of mine, OBGYN, Stacy Lindau at uh, Northwestern, um, launched this fabulous program in Chicago. It's now in multiple cities. It's called MAPS Core, where she recruits teenagers in high school to go out and actually map the community re resources, the store funds, and all the resources that clinicians might want, you know, be able to refer to. So they're now sort of trying to spread that model across different sites. So, um, and for all of this, to, for, for health systems to tackle these technical implementation and policy issues, they have to have better evidence for ROI. How is this going to, you know, because that's an investment. How am I going to either at least not lose money and improve health and outcomes or actually save some money, i.e. reduce hospitalizations, as long as you're not still in a volume uh, financing environment? So some of the things that health services research, we really need to capitalize on all these new data. We, as I alluded to earlier, we have to figure out the role of data science and new methods in our field. Um, we also have to, ta right? ah, there, yes, I have some animation here. So um, one of the things we did is to, to really try to grapple with this data science and HSR, our methods council, our board of directors expanded it to be a methods and data council, and we just appointed um, six or seven new members of that council to help us. Um, we have to tackle complex data development issues. And uh, let me go back so I can see what I'm supposed to say. There, development, aggregation, and curation. Um, and this access and governance issues, this is not easy. Um, and one of the things we launched is eGEMS, which is this electronic journal, peer-reviewed, open access, that's all about some of the, you know, how we want data, but how, when, privacy, governance, et cetera. Um, and the third one is that we need to embrace innovation, but with a healthy skepticism. You know, you've, what's it called, the hype curve? Who's, whose is it? A Carter's hype curve. So, you know, we need to be able to see through that and, um, and understand which innovations are actually working. And that's where we are now, um, one of the reasons we do the Health Data Palooza is to convene that innovation sector, but to come to it with all our best um, rigor and questions. Um, and then, of course, we have to partner across sectors and disciplines. This is very much a multidisciplinary field. So, oops. So I've talked about social determinants, healthcare delivery, and data. It's a very exciting time for health services research. Um, I've only skimmed the surface of some of the questions that folks have, um, but the important thing is that these questions are really important. They actually matter. I remember when uh, Vice President Joe Biden spoke at Data Palooza three years ago, and it was just after his son, Beau Biden, had died, and he said, you know, what you do, all these data geeks, what you do matters, you know, Getting this right, improving care, is about saving lives. So um, I will conclude that as no surprise, right, Daryl? Evidence does matter. We believe so, um, and perhaps now more than ever. So I stay focused on our North Star at Academy Health, evidence. Thank you. so much. We definitely have time for uh, at least 10 minutes of questions. So uh, I think we are being, we've been invited to use the mics uh, if you have a question. Okay. How many of you are um, clinically prepared? MD, RN, pharmacist, allied health professional. Okay. How many of you are uh, PhD prepared social scientists of one stripe or another? Okay, how many of you are students? Okay, who'd I miss? Healthcare administrators, consultants. <laughs> all right, it's a rich ecosystem. We're all necessary to answer all these questions and make healthcare better. Come on, don't be shy. I was trying to warm you up.
Come on, come on, come on. For posterity. Great. And Harlan, Harlan Belcher was with us last week um, from Kennedy Krieger at our ACES meeting that we had last week. Yeah, no, they do a lot of work. And also uh, Joyce Harrison, she does a lot. Yes. So um, as a clinician, I've also started working, uh, doing, um, using telemedicine in my clinical practice to connect to an underserved area on the Eastern Shore. Uh, as you know, most of the telehealth um, innovations, I mean, they can't, they're all grant funded. Um, and it does make a difference in the life of the, uh, of the people in, in the underserved areas, but how do you scale it and where do we look for replicability? I would like to make the program bigger, but again, it all goes down to the funding and reimbursement um, and also like trying to get quality data. Uh, is there a way to magnify what I'm doing or how do I get the funding or how do we get quality so, data? Yeah, um, I think in our field, um, certainly since we've been doing the Data Palooza and I've been learning a lot about this whole other world of venture capital, startups, and you know the technology world, you know, we're so, I, I was trained and we're so used to get a grant to do X, Y, Z, and they come at it from how can I make it a business? I mean, and as folks remind us, we are a capitalist market economy um, and they're, you know, can you make money off it? And telehealth is just, it's sort of taking off in the last two years in a way that, you know, we've been trying to get telehealth off the ground for 25 years. So I think there are more opportunities now than ever. There was a piece that one of our vice presidents, who some of you may know because she has an adjunct appointment here, Marco Edmonds, wrote in New England Journal of Medicine with Reed Tuxen when he was the president of the American Telemedicine Association on telehealth and its dimensions. So I'm happy to connect you to some of our contacts more in the sort of startup world and just to bat some ideas uh, with them because that may be an opportunity because that is a big problem with our field is that we get foundation philanthropic funding, we get a grant, we start a program, it seems to work. And you know how do you hand it off to a sustainable market uh, presence? So um, that is a transition. You know, for the biomedical sciences, we talk about tech transfer, and you know because there's a patent at the end or there's some you know ROI for the university. We haven't got that mindset in health services research of what's the pat you know what's the handoff you know. So. I can repeat it, Jody. So a lot of telehealth programs, I mean, whether it's WellDoc or TeleDoc or all these new um, companies, it's, it's in terms of customer service and savings. Um, because you can see more people, you can cut down on you know specialist um, networks, you can have a more controlled network of, of you know, tertiary care that, so you can control the quality. Um, so there are lots of different rationales for why some insurance companies are moving into that. Again, it varies by market conditions very much so. Um, and so, you know, the ECHO model out of New Mexico has done great. It hasn't worked so well in some other markets. So it, it really de depends on the, the dominance of the, the market power. So, and then of course we didn't, you know, there's the whole thing about state licensing and regulatory context that makes it very difficult. So. So. I don't think it's on. No. I'll repeat it. And I forgot to repeat your question, Jody. My bad. <laughs> so my question was just around something you t brought up earlier about the transdisciplinarity within the field. You know, health services research itself is kind of, it's not just econ economics or pol political science or sociology. It's a mishmash of those things together in some ways. Um, and we're even reaching out beyond that. We're including different kinds of clinicians. We're including um, data scientists now. We're including engineers. Uh, and so as far as the future of health services research and how to kind of promote transdisciplinarity, what do you think are maybe some of the, the barriers to that and then uh, facilitators? So great question. Um, and just to repeat the question, uh, what are the barriers and facilitators to promoting the transdisciplinary nature of health services research as we, you know, work with, you know, different disciplines, uh, 
uh, engineering, operations, research, data science, et cetera. So we, um, this came up through our health services research consortium about a decade ago, even then, where the initial slice or wedge into the conversation was around um, research in delivery systems and how do we uh, engage more effectively and make sure that students and trainees who are coming up in the field understand that there are career options that are beyond the sort of straight academic uh, success of your F, your K, your R, et cetera. And so we launched in partnership at the time, the first three sites we worked with were Geisinger, Intermountain Health, and um, PAMFRI, Palo Alto Medical Research Foundation Institute, and we launched the Delivery System Science Fellowship in 2012. That's now been going for six years, and we've worked with 15 delivery systems around the country, and we have had almost every discipline you can think of come through there. Every year we get about 30 to 40 applicants, and between three and 10 get selected by a site. Um, and so, and again, they're multidisciplinary at different stages of their career, but it's about giving folks an opportunity to go work in a different employment setting as what folks call, some folks call it an embedded setting where you're not solely um, pursuing extramural dollars. You're actually trying to answer questions that the operational leaders have, whether those are clinical or others. So that's one thing. We're now launching the second fellowship sort of to that end, um, but looking more at life sciences. And that's uh, it's going to be announced very shortly. It's called the Real World Evidence Fellowship. So again, trying to, you know, traditionally life sciences has been dominated by pharmaco, epi, and pharmaco economics. But with the, again, the onslaught of data, data changing the opportunities, there's this whole new focus now on real world evidence. So launching that. The third thing is this workforce summit that we hosted in, in 2016, at the end of 16, and of, from which the supplement to HSR will be out later this summer, um, came out with a whole set of recommendations that our education council then went over and prioritized. And we're going to be, and we're talking to our training, pro, the HSR training program directors about. Um, but one of the recommendations, because they grappled with this very same question, was that we need during our training is, well, two things. They wanted us to cr create, um, not avatars, nothing so fancy as that, but sort of these, you know, use cases. Instead of an IT use case, it's a use case of a career. Like, here's this example. Or you could be this kind of person, or you could be this kind of person. So these different use cases, these career trajectories, to show folks um, that there are many ways to be in health services research. And then to, uh, the thing we want to talk more with the program directors about is uh, the, the, the recommendation was very strong for more experiential learning while you're doing your terminal degree. What kinds of experiences out, outside an academic setting do you have? And I thought what was really interesting is that those experiential experience, those experiential whatever components are not limited to the students, that the faculty actually need them too. Because most, and, and if you haven't seen it, the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine, every decade or so, they come out with a report on the biomedical research workforce. So that one just came out earlier in pre-pub, April 12th. And you know a lot of same old, same old recommendations, but it reinforces that most folks trained in research of any kind are not gonna end up working in academics. They're gonna work elsewhere. And so we have to be much better at training them for the diversity of employment settings where they will be. Hi, um, is this on? No, but I'll repeat your question. It is on? Okay. Oh, it is. So, so hi, I'm from the health system. I work with Patty Brown. And uh, so I started my career clinically as a trauma nurse for years in New York. And so today my responsibility is leading a health plan, and it happens to be a military health plan. So my question, and I'm the benefactor of all the amazing health services research that goes on here, most directly Jonathan Weiner's research, but specifically my question relates to precision medicine. And you're thinking about sort of the concept of the learning health system and the capturing and the measurement of the bi-directional learning and iterations and algorithms and those types of things. I didn't, you talked a little bit about real world evidence, but um, I, I didn't hear a lot about that. You touched on clearly, obviously, the data and the health delivery, but my interest specifically is pulling this evidence and implementing it yeah. to help so I'd love to know you're thinking about that. No, great, great point. Um, obviously, I think, or maybe not obviously, but I think you're absolutely right that this concept of a learning health system that is generating evidence and using evidence in this virtual cycle, virtuous cycle constantly is where we need to end up. Um, we're a long way from there uh, for a whole host of reasons. Um, 
Academy Health and its members are very much you know, trying to do more of that. There's a whole new uh, journal of learning health systems that Chuck Friedman launched. Um, he, he's also launching, I think, a community of learning health systems. We have been uh, specifically trying to uh, get a better sense of, you know, one of the things, and it was said earlier today in our conversations, that Academy Health and the field is a very big tent. And then within that big tent, there are smaller tents. And so one of the, apart from data science and trying to figure out how to bring that in, the other one is the subset of our field that considers themselves delivery science, you know, healthcare delivery science. There are more and more of these centers that are in health systems. And so I've been calling up through a completely non-systematic, convenient sample of leaders of these delivery science centers around the country to find out, you know, where's your professional home? What are your struggles? What do you need? So we're trying to figure out how we can connect more effectively with delivery systems in uh, in a real time way, we're not there yet. So I'd love your thoughts offline uh, Great, because that I'd is definitely something we're interested in. Great, thank you. Uh, Eric Bass, I'm a general internist. Uh, at a recent uh, Hill Day visit, I had a meeting with a congressman who will go unnamed, who uh, explained that the federal government had no role in uh, health services research, essentially. Um, given sort of the ambitious kind of research agenda you describe, the challenges of conducting that type of work, what do you see as sort of the, the role of the government in supporting uh, all of this work that needs to be done? And realistically, uh, what are the prospects of getting the government to support uh, the kind of work that you've um, put forth here? Sure. Thanks, Eric, for that. And, and thanks for your leadership, too. Um, so this is um, not the first time I've heard this, uh, not surprisingly. And um, part of what Academy Health does is we, we are, as I mentioned earlier, the voice for health services research in Washington, which means we do have an advocacy component. We do have an ability to lobby as a 501c3. It's a very small dollar amount. And so I go up to the Hill all the time um, to educate members. Um, I'm not a registered lobbyist, uh, but we, ha we have a registered lobbyist on contract to, to talk about health services research and federal support for it. And um, again, to, a couple things. I've been doing this you know, first as a member and now as the CEO for the last seven years. Um, we are always having to explain what is health services research and that it is part of the larger governmental national investment in the health research continuum. So one of our strategies has been to make more clear that it's not about this kind of research over here. It's about you have a research continuum, whether it's T1 to T3, pick your framework that is more familiar. And we've done a number of Hill briefings in partnership with Research America where we'll have a basic scientist talk about some new discovery about, you know, we've done them on COPD and cardiac and, you know, pick your disease. We've done five or six. And then more of a sort of pharma, biopharma, talking about developing whatever product for market. And then a leading health services researcher talk about the questions from health services research. And that's, we've found that's been very helpful for the staff to understand. Um, in terms of um, government investment, uh, w what I respond to is that, first of all, it's part of the overall research investment. We're not going to you know, reap the benefits of all these cures and discoveries unless we can actually deliver them. And so when, you know, discovery, development, delivery, those are the three arms of what we need to improve health in America. And the other point I make, and this is from data in a 2015 JAMA article that um, Hamilton Moses and his colleagues wrote, is that the amount of money that's invested in R&D from the health services industry is like the chart in JAMA, it's like all these, and then down here is health services. So the percent, both in total dollars and percent of um, pro revenues, it's much smaller. So, and then the final argument is, and the taxpayer pays for how much of health care through Medicare, Medicaid, and CHIP, and so we need to know what we're paying for. Yeah. So, and I want to thank you and the organization for all you do to advocate for that. And I would sort of encourage everyone, if you're not already connected with Academy Health and the Friends of ARC, uh, this would be good. This is the right time to yes. get on board with that. So. Yeah. Thank you, Eric, and thanks, thanks for that PSA. That's great. <laughs> um, and I would say that, you know, this past year when they finally did the Omnibus 2018 budget, um, for the first time, as one indicator, a proxy indicator, um, ARC's budget went up $10 million. That's the first time in nine years that it hasn't been either flat or cut. And so, you know, are we turning the tide on understanding or is it just that, you know, they bust through the budget cap so everybody was feeling, you know, generous and we all got a bit more. 
Eh, you know, but right now I think there is an opportunity for the field to think, to step back, which we are doing, and to think about the current structure of health services research, whether it's an, you know, it stays at AHRQ plus all the NIH institutes plus the other parts and PCORI, or is there a different structure? I mean, PCORI's authorization goes away in 2019. Um, and if it disappears, not only does that 600 million to PCORI go away, but also about 100 million to ARC, because a quarter of ARC's budget is now from the trust fund. So these are all things we're very much worried about um, and stepping back and looking at. I think that um, we should probably wrap up here, but uh, a really sweeping and uh, thought-provoking presentation uh, uh, ended with a challenge to save ARC or to at least save health services research. So thank you so much. Uh, we're very grateful. Thank you.